her degree as a registered dental hygienist in 1977. She became licensed as an emergency medical tech medical technician in 1986. She then continued her education to earn a PhD in holistic nutrition and integrative medicine. She's a board certified naturopath and was commissioned in pastoral medicine. She has served on the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners. She was featured in the movie Root Cause on Netflix. In conclusion, she is also a member of the IAOMT and an executive director of IAB D DM. Welcome, Don Ewing. All right. Um, it's true. I, my dad told me when I was little I could be anything I wanted to be. He just didn't tell me I had to pick. And so I started off in dentistry, got out of dentistry, got into emergency medicine. My husband and I used to fly around the world and pick up patients. We also worked on a 911 ambulance. And then I went back into dentistry as, uh, as a hygienist only because my son was born and it's hard to travel around the world and be on a 911 ambulance with a small baby. And uh, I decided to go back to school. So I got a PhD in nutrition and then I went back to school again and I became a naturopath and I went back to school again and got another PhD in integrative medicine. And then my husband said, you can't go to school anymore because your school loans are more than our mortgage and you need to start working. So then I found a way to get my passion fulfilled with education. I became the executive director of the IABDM. So now I get to pick and choose all the continuing education, all the people who speak. So that makes me happy. And plus, I don't have to pay for it now. So that's really good. OK, so today we're going to talk about periodontal disease and some lab work that you could do. Now, we know that the mouth affects the rest of the body. And we know that periodontal disease plays a really important part. If you ever have gone to an AOSH meeting or you know about systemic dentistry, then they talk about that. But many, many years ago, that was just rubbish. There's no way that periodontal disease could influence anything. And I'm going to show you some ways that it actually can. So first off, we want to know if the person is having a perio problem. Is it localized or is it generalized? That makes a big difference. It could be localized if it's just from a little crown, maybe a nickel crown. Then you want to ask the person, do they have a nickel allergy? Uh, toxins from a root canal, maybe you just see the gingiva is inflamed around that one area. Oftentimes you find that somebody has cemented a crown even with temporary cement and that's caused a problem for the individual or a poor margin of a restoration. Sometimes packing food in between the teeth can cause a problem. Mouth breathers, you know, you start seeing that and you see it on the anterior teeth or an ill-fitting partial, something that's creating trauma for that particular area or a burn. So those would be things that are just localized. We want to know, is it acute or chronic? So how many people have seen reactions from somebody using a toothpaste that has sodium lauryl sulfate in it? So then you just tell the patient, you know, don't you try a toothpaste that doesn't have anything there? Let's see what happens. And then they see that there's a, uh, an improvement. Or certain foods. You know, years ago, and I mean many years ago, this is probably when I was 13 years old, and um, I started my menses about that time. And it just so happened that every time I would have a, the start of my cycle, my tongue would swell up out of my mouth. I mean, could not close my mouth. It's sticking out like this. So after about the fourth month of going to my doctor, my doctor told my mom, you should take her to an OBGYN. Here we are looking at the foods, and I, I particularly liked red cream soda at that time. I'm a teenager. That was just what I liked. But come to find out, I was actually having hormonal issues. And so you, you want to look at everything when it has to do with the mouth because we can't just always think it has to do with plaque and bacteria. So what if your perio treatment doesn't make the person respond at all? You want to rule out certain things. You want to pay attention to asking the person questions about diabetes. Maybe you're going to be the one that actually refers them out and they find out that they have leukemia. You want to ask if the person has reflux. I saw somebody this last week, and the first question I asked her was, why are your teeth like this? They're all broken off. Do you regurgitate food? I mean, do you have reflux, or are you a purger? No, I just haven't seen a dentist in a really long time. I'm still not sure. It almost looked like meth mouth, but I couldn't believe that that would be her that was, was doing that. Um, 
You just, just not that there's a profile for people who do math. You would be surprised when you get an emergency medicine. It's the people that are well dressed that are doing drugs. It's not always the people that look like scum buckets. You also want to know if the patient has suffered any kind of a, a stroke or loss in dexterity because maybe that's their problem, you know, just that they can't take care of their mouth. Okay, so the value in requesting labs, and when I teach biological 101, especially when I teach it for hygienists, I have this saying that I say over and over and over again. When in doubt, refer out. And that's just the safest thing to do. If you ever are suspicious about something, then you write a letter to their primary care and say, is there a way you could rule out blood sugar problems? You don't even have to distinguish the difference between insulin resistance or diabetes. Just could you rule out blood sugar problems? This person is, is not resolving their periodontal disease, and I just need to rule out some other things. Plus, it lets that physician know that you're paying close attention to their patients. Imagine if you are an endocrinologist and you deal a lot with diabetes and you know that there's a dentist in the area that is paying attention to what your patient's hemoglobin A1C is. It's just going to be really impressive and so that doctor may start making referrals into your office. So if that patient does not have a team, you want to help them build one. And that's the important part, whether it's a, a chiropractor that they need because they've got an atlas and an axis that are out of line and you're getting ready to do full mouth reconstruction. Imagine how that's going to play into perio issues if they have a bad bite. So it might be that you're referring them to a chiropractor. It's looking at the labs that is something that is really outside of the scope of traditional dentistry, but I want to teach you enough about it so you know when to refer out. So we're going to look at how some of these labs can help. These are the common labs that I ask my patients to get drawn, and I do it through a company that um, will do an $800 panel for $80. Now, that's a bargain for anybody, right? And this is what they'll draw everything on here short of the D3. The D3 is a little, little extra for that. But of course we're looking at kidney function here. Not everybody always draws a uric acid. So how popular is a keto diet right now? Very. But if they don't have digestive enzymes to break down that much protein or fats, then their uric acid is going to go up. Uh. You want to look at their calcium. I don't give calcium. It's seldom that I, I actually have a patient walk out with calcium. I look at their protein absorption because that helps build good bone. You want to look at liver enzymes. You want to pay attention to things like the RDW because that's going to play into an MTHFR flaw. Oh my God, Nestor. This thing is going crazy on its own. Okay, am I too loud? Thank you. So when you're looking at this panel of blood, you know, uh, if you've listened to me before, you know there are different kinds of anemia. You can have iron anemia, but you can also have B12 anemia, folic acid anemia, vitamin C anemia, B6 anemia, copper anemia. And so you need to be able to distinguish what that is. And if you can't, then you need to refer them out because anemia is going to play into problems for perio issues. We can also look at things like uh, the vitamin C level, and I'm going to go into that in just a minute. Uh, infection, bacteria versus viral, or thyroid issues, or low vitamin D. Okay, so a hemoglobin A1C. You can do a hemoglobin A1C with a test kit from CVS, Walgreens. There usually are two tests in there for about $40. Now, if you want to get it in the office, you can actually get more in a package for a little better price break than that $20. But this is a non-fasting test, so it doesn't matter when you do it. It's a simple test to do chair side. You just pop the finger, use the little gadget that comes with it. Ideal would be you want that number to be 5.7 or less. 5.7 is my absolute cutoff. Now, if they show up with a 5.8 twice, they're pre-diabetic. So when you're looking at this, you'll see that uh, 7 is considered a managed diabetic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about uh, the hemoglobin A1C. And if you don't know what that is, okay, you have a glucose. That's your you know, first morning 
blood sugar if you're going first thing in the morning, and that's a fasting test. The hemoglobin A1C is looking at the amount of excess sugar coated on the outside of a red blood cell over a 120-day period. So it's more an average. Am I doing something wrong? Okay. So other things that can make that hemoglobin A1C elevate. One would be an infection. Well, root canal is a chronic low-grade infection. I don't care how you treat that tooth. It's still going to be a chronic low-grade infection. But maybe they have an upper respiratory infection. Maybe they have a urinary tract infection. All of those things will make their blood sugar go up. So if somebody comes in with elevated blood sugar, I'm already thinking what kind of infection could they have. Steroid use. You're not really supposed to give a steroid injection or steroids to someone who has diabetes because it can make their blood sugar unmanageable. Certain drugs, like anti-rejection uh, drugs after transplants, those are all things that could make a hemoglobin A1C go up. So you're going to have, in these diabetic patients, and it's important that you treat them as a diseased patient. And I'm going to say that several times today. Diabetes is a disease. Periodontal disease is a disease. You have to ingrain that into your patient. They're going to experience things like dry mouth. Okay, well, now they're going to have less of a salivary flow. Their decay rate could easily go up. They're going to have gingivitis just because they've got more bacteria. They're going to be slower healers. So if they cut themselves while flossing or if they have to have some kind of oral surgery, it's going to take them longer to heal. They're going to be more prone to thrush. Some of these people even tell you, especially pre-diabetes, that they have a burning tongue. That should be a clue for you, burning tongue. Okay, years ago... I remember a gentleman that amputated his fingers. We took him to uh, Vintob. They surgically reattached all his fingers. And then several weeks later, they looked like that because he was unwilling to give up cigarettes. How stupid is that? Really? The nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. Diabetes, what it does when your sugar elevates, picture this in your mind. I'm real big about word pictures. So picture that you have a red blood cell and it has little sharp edges all over it, like little razor blades. You've seen those Chinese guys that ping, they throw those little gadgets that have razor blades all over them and they're shaped like a star. Okay, so when you have blood sugar coated on the outside of a red blood cell, it scratches all the arteries. If you've ever seen... Um, an autopsy, and you get to look at the inside of the cardiovascular system on someone who has elevated blood sugars, it looks like someone's gone like that. Okay, I want you to remember that that, that is doing that for this individual. So we've got a diabetic that smokes. They are now 20 times more likely to develop either thrush or periodontal disease. So now don't you think it's fair that I, I don't make people do things I offer them the education. I don't really rag at them unless I think they're killing themselves, and then I'll tell them that they're stupid. But other than that, I just offer information and say, you know, it's your body. You get to pick and choose what you want. If I'm hungry and there's not anything nutritious, I'm going to be at McDonald's because I'm hungry. But it's what you do on an everyday basis that's really important. And so we want to talk to them about how that nicotine causes vasoconstriction, and now we can't get blood good blood circulation to the bone, which I'm going to show you a picture of the bone, and to the gum tissue itself. So that hemoglobin A1C becomes an important number for us. So people with type 1 or type 2, pre-diabetes even, should be monitored very carefully. They're at 2 to 3, this is the pre-diabetic, 2 to 3 times more likely to develop gum problems or periodontal disease. So that high glucose can reduce the blood supply to the gums. Remember, it's kind of scratching the inside of there. It increases the risk of infection, decreases the salivary flow. We already talked about that. And they end up with more sugar in the sulcus, which means that they're going to be at higher risk for decay right at the gum line. Okay, so periodontal disease and diabetes are diseases. I already said that. But you need to ingrain that in these people's mind. They are not coming for a routine prophy. So you want to ask the patient immediately upon seeding, what was your hemoglobin A1C last time? So that you can log it in your chart. 
If not, you should be testing it at the chair. That would be a smart thing to do and really not very invasive to do. You can even have them do it themselves. If they're diabetic, they are very used to doing this test themselves. So with an elevated hemoglobin A1C, you would like to have more frequent hygiene appointments. You are the one that is going to make the biggest impact on their health. I have had patients before with elevated hemoglobin A1Cs really coach them on flossing. And no, I'm not a hygienist anymore. I still have my license. But patients come in to see me for health problems, and I have a roll of floss there. And I am sitting there coaching them about how they need to floss, and they come back with no dietary changes, and their hemoglobin A1C is lower. Why? Because chronic low-grade infections will elevate their hemoglobin A1C. So it becomes important for those individuals to keep their mouth clean, just as important as it, as it is for them not to get ingrown toenails or foot infections. You know, a diabetic has a tendency to go blind, go on dialysis, lose their toes, and lose their teeth. So if we say that the average person goes, and I don't, I'm not the average person, I don't get my hair cut this often. But every six weeks, most people go in and get their hair cut. Well, when you talk to a patient about coming in for more frequent hygiene appointments, oh, my insurance isn't going to pay for that. Oh, my God. But you're going to go pay $120 to get your hair highlighted and cut. And yet you're not going to come in here and take care of a disease. Cut me some slack here. So when we're looking at things like platelets, and you know, they don't teach this in dental school. Somebody comes in, they have a toothache, and you look at this tooth and it's completely periodontally involved. You could just almost take it out with your fingers. How often do you ask a patient to look at their last blood work? Those platelets better be higher than 150, because if not, that person is at risk of bleeding and continuing to bleed. So that's not a good thing. So you want to make sure that they're high enough. If not, then in, in, when in doubt, refer out. You want to have a letter clearing them from their physician. Maybe they know they have ITP and their platelet counts are low. I've seen patients come in and they, you know, yes, they know they have it and their platelets are like 80 and I'm going, no, 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 no. We've got to do some things like either put you on melatonin or you can use papaya leaf extract and get the platelets to come up. But there, we, we can't, we can't even do a scaling and root planing if you're going to bleed to death on us. Not a good thing. You also want to start with a microscope. So Oxana is, of course, the queen of looking at the microscope. But we don't often teach more than looking at an amoeba or a spirochete or trichomonas. That's, that's pretty much what we stay with with dentistry. But once you get really good at this, you start noticing things like, wow, there's a ton of white blood cells in this slide that I'm looking at. And this was not a purulent pocket that you drew it from. Obviously, if you took your sample and you saw a bunch of pus, what would you expect to see on the slide? A bunch of white blood cells. But if you took it from an area and you really didn't think that this area is diseased, but when you're looking at the slide, there's just way too many white blood cells, that should send up a red flag for you to refer out because that might be your sign that that person has leukemia. So here we're looking at a slide. It's an awful lot of white blood cells in this slide in comparison to other things that we're seeing. So what if the lymphocytes are too high in your blood work? In leukemia, the white blood cells and the lymphocytes are high, and usually you'll see the platelets are low. When you have high lymphocytes, it could be viral, like maybe they're in an active form of mono. You know, these patients that come in that have EBV, or do they have swollen lymph glands? Do they have cytomegalovirus? Refer out. If you're low in vitamin C, do you know that humans are the only thing that really can't make vitamin C? We have to take it in from our supplements. So when we take our vitamin C in, first off, you'd like to have a buffered kind, or you'd love to have something like a lipospheric kind, unless you're really lucky and you can go get IVs of vitamin C. But it helps support collagen. So you're always looking for ways to talk to your perio patient. You may have a lady sitting in your chair that just does not care that she has bad breath, and she does not care that her teeth are waving in the breeze, but she cares about wrinkles. So you talk to her about the collagen tissue in her face and how improving her vitamin C will coincidentally tighten up her teeth because it's made out of similar tissue. 
and it also supports the immune system. Did you know that you can actually test for vitamin C? So, you know, when you talk to your patient and they say, yes, I have a horrible fatigue, nobody can find out what it is. They tell me I don't have a thyroid problem. You see bleeding gums and it's not a pregnant woman. So you're not thinking it's hormone, maybe it's a guy. You look on the slide and you see huge dips in the red blood cell. So you start wondering, or you see star-like projections coming off of that red blood cell. Then you start thinking about different forms of anemia. This is what the bone looks like. This obviously is a skull, but you can see that it's, it's not smooth like it's supposed to be. It's really porous. And this is the same thing that happens in the jawbone. You know, I often wonder why a dental office is not the first place that we're thinking about osteopenia and osteoporosis. Because where do we take x-rays the most often in, in a body? Bite wings. So if we start seeing problems with the bone there, you should be networking with the primary care to see if maybe there's a bone problem throughout the entire body. Here is a vitamin C test that can be done. It's through longevity. There are other places that do some vitamin C blood tests. So when it's less than 0.3, then we know that there's a problem. And when, when it's even at 2, you're starting to think of issues here. Years ago, I used to do the lingual ascorbic acid test in the mouth. Has anybody ever done that before? You mix up this little blue solution and put it on the tongue. If it goes away, then you go, ooh, you don't have enough vitamin C. Uh, we couldn't really correlate that tightly enough, so now looking at blood levels are a little bit better. Vitamin D. How many of you know that vitamin D is not a vitamin? It's a hormone. Really? It is. It's produced by, by the kidneys to control the calcium concentration, so it would make sense. And you, does anybody know what a vitamin D level should be? 60 to 80. You know, I have patients that come in and they're telling me that they're having brain fog or they're emotionally unstable, and I'll see vitamin D levels of 12. I possess the genetic flaws that I cannot absorb sunshine. You know, you should be able to take in the sunshine, convert it into vitamin D. I, I must have been standing in the wrong line, but I don't have all the genes to be able to do that. So I have to take a vitamin D supplement the rest of my life in order to keep my vitamin D level up. So there's some really cool things that you find out when you start doing genetic testing. You know, when we first started looking at the MTHFR, we said, oh, okay, you're MTHFR positive, you need to take a methyl B12. Well, now we know that if you also have COMT along with that, that you could overmethylate. So we want to look at using in a dental form or using a hydroxyl instead of just giving you methyl B12. So as we learn more, we just find out we don't know as much as we thought we did. It's just always changing. But when we're looking at this vitamin D, we also want to look at things like dairy allergies or Crohn's disease, the inability to break down fat. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. So I think part of my issue is that years ago on the ambulance, I got assaulted and had to have my gallbladder removed. So that's going to interfere with my ability to break down fats, correct? And so be Vitamin D being a fat-soluble vitamin, I'm going to have more of an issue, even without all my genetic flaws. So I have to make sure that I'm taking a form of vitamin D that's in fat that I can absorb. And then monitor it by getting your vitamin D again to make sure that it's coming up. So we also look at K. A lot of people need to be on a D with K in it. When you're talking to people about their diet, and it is important, you know your teeth have to do with your diet. A lot of people take in their food and they don't even chew it. I don't know if they think their stomach has teeth. I don't know, but I see people swallow huge amounts of food and they're not really breaking it down. So yes, it's your job to talk to them about diet. If you ask them to fill out a three-day diet history, it's interesting to see how few vegetables people eat. Yes, now that they're on keto, they're eating higher protein, but they're really not pushing through the green vegetables. And if they do that, they will start experiencing constipation. If you're not looking at lab work to see that their uric acid is going up, then they could end up with a bad case of gout just simply because of their diet. But they're also going to be lacking vitamin K because your vitamin K comes from all those green things like chard and uh, kale and things that people aren't really keen to eat. Now in the South, we eat a lot of that. I don't know how it is um, other places. 
So some other things that you might want to look at, besides things like a CRP, okay, but I have used a CRP and seen inflammation on people that don't have perio disease, so I've kind of taken that out of what I choose to look at for perio and really started even thinking outside of the box from that. So a lot of my people, when they come through and I do that main panel that I was talking about, I might even have them do salivary testing for adrenals. Does anybody, you know about the adrenal glands, they're your fight or flight, but they also are governing over the thyroid and then how you absorb calcium and, and affects your bone and osteopenia and osteoporosis. So in a roundabout way, how you process that, and the adrenal glands, I'm going to use myself as an example because I'm a good example for that. Um, I'm a type A personality, so I'm like the ever-ready bunny. I'm just go, 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 go until I finally just fall over and my battery runs out. When I worked on the ambulance, if I didn't feel well, then I had the opportunity to pick up the phone and call and say, ah, oh, my throat is sore, I just don't feel good. I get someone to cover my shift so that I could stay home and rest and repair. But when you're your own business owner and you don't feel well, who is going to fill your shoes for the day? It's just not going to happen. So you have to call upon your adrenal glands for them to make cortisol for you to be able to make it through the day. As you do that over and over and over again, you put so much strain on those adrenal glands that you go through adrenal fatigue. Now, if you look at those individuals, you will find that, you know, your uh, cortisol level should start off at its highest first thing in the morning. So let's say 6 o'clock in the morning, it's here. And then it goes down at noon, and then it goes down at 4 because you'd really like to just go home and put your feet up. And then at midnight, it should be its lowest because you're supposed to be resting and repairing. When you do that salivary test, if you see a couple of those are elevated, that's because your body thinks that in any moment, a lion is going to jump out and you need to be able to run. So it's really important that you have extra cortisol there. But that is going to make you go through adrenal burnout. And when you're in burnout, then that's going to affect absolutely everything in your system. And those, those are the individuals that tell you, I can't even get out of bed in the morning. It's just horrible. You know, my husband and I are not having sex anymore. And I just, I have no energy to take care of the kids. And so I know a lot of my patients come in and they expect everything is going to be alternative. But, you know, if you're hit by a truck, it's not the time to take Arnica. It is the time to be at an ER and find out if you have a ruptured spleen. So the same thing, when you have certain things that go wrong, that's what prescriptions are for. And that's where Cortef really comes in, and those people then call me up and go, oh, my God, I know I fought you for forever, but we're having sex again. And I'm going, see, now you have energy to be able to do the things that you'd like to do, but you just didn't have any oomph to do it. But that all plays into perio health. There are other things like your PT time or your PTT or your INR that have to do with circulation to the bone and to the gum. So there's no reason why you can't look at those two, although those are usually things that are looked at when you're going to do surgery and the person is on something like Plavix or they're on some type of heparin or a thinner because they've already had a stroke or something and you want to make sure that they're not going to bleed out. You know, years ago we just took them off of stuff for three days. Now you don't have to do that anymore. You just have to check your times. Low CoQ10. Now CoQ10 is important in two different areas of the body. It's a lot of places, but it's predominantly in the cardiovascular, in your heart, and your gums. So we can look at CoQ levels and see, and Healthy is somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5 in a, a CoQ test. And that can be done through blood work as well. And they're not expensive. I want to say this is like between $30 and $50 to get that run. I think a vitamin C is about $30. Uh, usually if you go on longevity, you can get stuff done. There are anytime labs around now. There's... Um, directlabs.com. So there's a lot of different places where you don't have to have a physician's order. And so you can even tell the patient, hey, if you're curious and you want to do this on your own, it's out there. So again, CoQ10. These, this is the person that comes in and they really feel tired all the time. They're having a problem with their gums. Their memory and concentration is off. Uh, CoQ10 is something that I don't see any reason at all that you shouldn't have that in a dental office and be encouraging patients, especially if you hear that this person is on statins. And how many patients are on statins? A lot of them. It used to be that I would write a letter to a primary care physician and say, this is when I was a hygienist, 
um, I have a mutual patient, they're on statins, I'm working with their gum tissue, I have concerns about the statins maybe depleting the CoQ10, do you have a problem with me making a recommendation that they take 100 milligrams a day? And I have never had anybody come back. If, if anything, I've had some of them say, oh, I think now that you mention it, I'd like them to take 300 milligrams a day. Okay, that's fine. It's not like you overdose on it. So let's get into pH. We hear pH all the time, but it has to do with the potential of hydrogen. So our neutral is 7, and anything less than that is considered acidic which means that there's an increased of number of hydrogen ions. And anything over seven is considered alkaline. But let's see how it affects the body. So the pH is actually a reflection of the number of protons that are in the body, and it does play into your energy level. It also plays into your immune system. Digestion, and I'm going to show you how in just a minute because it really does play into digestion. And the maintenance of your mineral balance, which is really important when we're talking about bone health and of course bone density, and liver function. So the pH affects the function of the cell, which means the health of the body is at a cellular level. So it's all about the pH. It's not all about the base. Your logarithms for this mean that if I have a pH of six, it is 10 times more acidic than seven. And five is 100 times more acidic. So you're going to see how important this is, and the flip of that is true for the alkaline. So if we look at the pH, and I say that the ideal for a first morning urine pH for me is about 6.4 to 6.8. If it's not within that range, then I start having concerns for that individual. If the pH even goes up by a little bit, it can affect your body's ability to absorb minerals. So let's, let's see the domino effect. If I have a urine pH that is less than 6.3, I can't absorb zinc out of the foods that I eat. If I can't absorb zinc, I can't make hydrochloric acid. If I can't make hydrochloric acid, I can't absorb B12. I also can't break down proteins. Do you see how this is a domino effect? So the pH does become very important. It will change throughout the day, so I really want to know what their first morning urine pH is and I go from there. But when we're looking at the acidic individual, the, which is most people, and again, I like to use myself as an example. Um, when I was going through one of my PhD programs, we had to log our urine, first morning and our second morning urine pH for a month. And so during that time frame, I think I started off at about 5.5. And then we had to show with diet how we could change our first morning urine pH. And so, yeah, I saw if, if there were certain foods that I ate that I could get my urine pH up in that window of like 6.8, which was fine. But then one evening I was at a church event, and, it, and before I left, somebody walked in with warm brownies. Well, that's just downright sinful. But anyway, I ate one of those brownies. I went home and I brushed and flossed, but my first morning urine the next morning was back to 5.5. And so I had to document why in the world did my urine, it had been right in line. Why did it drop down to 5.5? And I went, really? A brownie? I'm a blood type O, so I don't do well with carbohydrates. I do better with protein. My husband is also a blood type O, but he's achlorhydric which means he does not make hydrochloric acid, so he has to take digestive enzymes in order to be able to break down the same protein, even though we're both blood type O's. So your body doesn't always read the book and follow the directions. That becomes very frustrating for patients. So when we're looking at this uh, pH that I was keeping, I documented that I had the brownie. My second morning urine rebounded. So I explained to the patients, this is a dawnism, which means that I just made this story up, but it's a visual. You have an acid fairy that comes into your body at night with a little feather duster and she dusts off all the cells and gets the acid off. Your body is working correctly. It will take that acid and dump it out as through the urine. So your body's not working correctly if you're acidic, but it's not able to do that. Then you've got some kidney problems, which you do see in people that are in renal failure. If she is able to get everything done, then your first morning urine might be slightly acidic, but your second morning urine will rebound. Okay, so my second morning urine didn't rebound. When I ate that brownie, my second morning urine was still in the fives. That was not good. I get back on track with my diet. Okay, then I, I had an event that happened, and I don't really remember what it was, but I did have to document it. I got into an argument with somebody on the phone 
about a bill that we had that this was the third time that I'd had the issue and I, I actually remember saying look I need someone who speaks English I need someone who's graduated from high school I need someone who knows how to work a fax machine because my pennies are in a wad right now because I'm upset this is the third month I've had to get this taken care of so I'm angry now the Bible says that you're not supposed to go to sleep on your anger but it didn't tell me why and I'm the kind of person that likes to know why before I'm really compliant and so what happened was I woke up the next morning and my first morning urine was the lowest it had ever been and the second morning urine didn't change at all so it was actually healthier for me to eat a carbohydrate late at night than it was for me to have stress so Stress is not something you can necessarily take a pill for. I'm still working on that. If somebody knows how to deal with that, let me know, because I've, I've got a child that's absolutely driving me crazy. But my point in telling you that is there are sodas out there, and I want to show you how bad sodas. Sodas put phosphoric acid in the drink that makes that uh, cause a problem. So, well, it's on another slide here. We'll get to it in just a second. So if I'm looking at finding balance, again, in the saliva, because in order to make that acid go through the kidneys, the byproduct is bicarb. And so what it's going to do is get up to the saliva. Now, if the saliva ends up too high, then I'm not going to be able to release pancreatic enzymes to break down carbohydrates. So it's all about finding balance. When the saliva is too acidic, it can cause a dry mouth. You might see it because someone's gone through chemotherapy, or it might be that smoker with that nicotine. You know, all of those things can cause the teeth to decay. And I found research that said, according to a study in 2013, you could actually use saliva as a diagnostic biomarker for looking at a person's risk factor for periodontal disease. And I put the source on there for you because I'd never seen that before. Okay, so here's our carbonated drinks. You are not going to believe this. Sodas are normally a pH of 2.5 which means that it would take you 30 glasses of water at a pH of 10, which is not usual, in order to neutralize one can. Now, that's even a diet soda. So the pH of your saliva can drop below 5.5. Imagine what that does to the enamel and to the bone. When you're drinking acidic beverages, this happens, and the acids in your mouth start to demineralize your teeth and your bones. So in an indirect way, sodas contribute to osteoporosis, osteopenia, and periodontal disease. So I want you to start thinking outside of what your traditional things are when you're talking to your patients. I really don't want you to have any fear whatsoever to network with some physicians in your area and say, this is what I'm getting ready to offer for my patients. Would you be able to run some of these tests? Don't be afraid to empower your patients to go get tests run on their own. Um, that panel that I showed you, that is the panel that we get run for $80. One year I got the bright idea. My husband, Toby, has great insurance from the county when he retired. And I got this bright idea that I would write everything down and I would go in for my well woman visit and I would ask them if they could draw all that. And they said, oh, sure, we can draw it. Well, we got a bill, and the bill was over $400, which is ridiculous because I could have had all those labs done for $80. So now, oftentimes, I'll get my labs run, and I'll just walk in for my well woman visit and say, here, here's my labs for this year. So it's not uncommon that people go get things done on their own, and, and sometimes it's just cheaper to do it without insurance, and you'll find that on, on a lot of things. So I wanted to leave a little extra time here in case anybody had any questions, and so I'm going to open it to, to questions right now. The $80 panel, um, I do that through Texas Wellness, but if you go to directlabs.com, they will do that same panel, I think is $90 through them. But if you go to Longevity, you can piecemeal some things out, and it's not too much more than that. And you can get some of those unique tests done, like the vitamin C and a CoQ10, and some of the other ones done. The, if you go through directlabs.com, theirs is called a wellness panel. Yes. I, I, I do have that in uh, part of my typed report that I give to the patient, but it's not something I look at often. You're going to see the phosphorus go up on uh, people that like are in renal failure. 
you're going to see it be low on uh, some of your patients that need to eat more greens or pumpkin seeds or they're low in zinc and again then we get back to the pH so a lot of times I'm asking patients give me as much information as you possibly can about your body so that I can help you out in the best way possible and that means I want to know what your first morning urine pH is I'd like to look at your last labs you know it's very frustrating when you look at labs because if I had a hundred labs in one building every one of those labs has a different set of values over here isn't that crazy every lab has to take all the sick people that went through their lab and take an average and then divide it by the number of people that came through take a standard deviation on either side and that becomes the healthy range for people that are in their labs now let me show you how this can be off Toby who's standing in the back of the room is a cancer survivor he gets his labs drawn when I ask labs to get drawn through the place that I use and his LDH not an LDL but an LDH that you know if it goes high could mean that there's diabetes it could mean that there's heavy metals if it's too low if it's too high it could be metastatic bone cancer there's a lot of it could it has to do with protein absorption as well so I do look at that number all the time but for his age and he's 63 64 somewhere around there it should be like 150 to 180 now when he goes to the lab the within normal value is somewhere between 130 and now this is the lab that he goes to all the time 130 and 190 so it's a little broader but when he goes down to MD Anderson which is our cancer clinic our major cancer clinic downtown in case y'all don't know that we're from Houston um, it comes back the range over here that says okay you're in the okay column he always comes back low that range is 700 to 1200 because who gets their labs drawn at MD Anderson people who are sick and dying of cancer and it's a marker for metastatic bone cancer so I always throw that column out and I have to go find healthy values for a person that age whether they're male or female and then I start looking at patterns of things so if the glucose is too high and the triglycerides are not then that means that they're low in thiamine and I, I have a little kind of formula that I go through for everything um, but you guys should start asking for labs even if it means they just have to bring in their labs from their primary care which is going to be impressive to the primary care and then refer back out especially for those diabetics I really really if I didn't drill anything home for you today it was that periodontal disease is a disease and so is diabetes and they need to be treated as if they have an active disease mm -hmm.